How are you feeling, Mike? Uh, uh, <laughs> this is like <laughs> this is like the worst possible feeling for me to have is what I'm feeling right now. No, you should feel amazing because it it's finally here. It's finally real. So much work made tangible. Why would you feel blah? You should feel ah! No, because this is that point of... You obviously feel this when you work on videos, right? Of like you uh-huh. work on something for so long. Right. And that feeling of you're about to like tell everyone about it or show it to everyone. Mm. It just feels horrible. It's very strange. Yeah, it's it's the... Well, there's nothing else to do. Now I get to see how it goes feeling. Mm-hmm. That's how you're feeling? That's how I'm feeling. Well, it's time to talk about... The Sidekick Notepad. So this is the second big product from Cortex Brand. So we have the Theme System Journal. And we've had some little bits here and there, right? So we have the Subtle Notebook. And obviously we have the Subtle Tea, the Subtle Sweater. We have the Cortex Mark One pen in collaboration with Studio Neat. We've, we've done lots of little explorations. But this is the second product that we kind of went and did the whole thing came up with the idea design arrange manufacture like you now it's like a real thing from nothing yeah this is the biggie yeah. everything else was some kind of like point one type of project but this is this is the thing where god i don't know what when must we have mentioned it years ago when we started to say like oh we're working on a second project yeah this this project began on the first of july 2021 Oh my god. <laughs> that was when I sat down and drew out what I was looking for. So let's say mm-hmm. so today we're going to talk about what this product is, but the majority of the conversation is going to talk about the 18 plus month manufacturing process and kind yeah. of what that has been like for us and then also talk a bit about what 2023 means for the company that we run together and how we're thinking about that, right? So like, yeah. I just want to set that out up front just so you know that we're going to give you our sales pitch on this product, but then we're going to talk about everything that went into making it and how I think it's, it feels like a horrible thing to say like at this point, but like how it is hopefully going to change our business. Yeah, putting on the line there, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I am. Yeah. This is going to end up being like, now we can tell you a lot of the things that we could never quite tell you as the project was going along mm-hmm. in this way where we always saw like, oh, it it will make sense shortly, right? Soon we'll be able to talk about this. It's just very interesting how we wanted to talk about this as it was going on, but the very process itself kind of made that completely impossible. And so now it's like, aha, there is a long story about how this came to be. And like, I think this is also interesting if like, if you are trying to make a product, this is why it takes so long. And yep. it's like, it's been, I've said this with the theme system journal and it's like 10 times more for sidekick notepad. It's amazing to me how long it takes physical products to get made. It's astounding to me that anything gets made in the physical world. And mm-hmm. now we can tell you some of why is it like that? First off, here's what it is. Sidekick Notepad is a landscape format notepad. It has 60 perforated pages. We use the same great paper as the Theme System Journal. It is laid out as about three quarters of dot grid for note taking, and then one quarter of the page is to do list. It's 30 centimeters wide by 18 centimeters deep, and it has been designed to sit comfortably between you and your keyboard. We'll talk about the soft launch of this product in a little bit, but it's been really interesting to me to see people putting them on their desks and the where they put them. Mm-hmm. It works great in front or behind the keyboard, depending on how you sit. We did a lot of testing for ergonomics. Like if people put this in between them and their keyboard, is it good? And I would answer yes, but your, you know, your own mileage will vary. But it also just works as a great notepad in meetings as well. That's kind of like the dual purpose of the product. We've made it so it's fantastic as the product to sit on your desk. So as you're taking notes, you know, throughout the day, as you're typing things, you're writing things, you want something to scribble down. Maybe you've got some to-do items you want to write down. And then at the end of the day, you can kind of transport those into your apps and services that you want, tear off the page and start fresh. But also it's the perfect product to take to a meeting environment. So you don't have your computer on the desk. It's not distracting you. You can write down all of your notes from the meetings, write down all of your action items on the side, take it to your desk and then transport that information into the places that it needs to go to. That's kind of what we've made this product for. 
Yeah, and it's where the name Sidekick Notepad comes from is because we were, we were really just thinking about this as like, it is your sidekick while you're working. Yeah. Like it's, it's there to help you do whatever it is that you're trying to do. And the vision of this notepad that is perfectly sized to sit in between you and your laptop on a table, that is really the core idea of this. And like you said, in addition, the... I need to go to a meeting. I want to be able to take notes. Those notes are going to be actionable and they're part of like what my day is, but I don't need to bring my whole computer along. And yep. it's like, that can just be distracting. And I've never liked to do it. Like this goes back yeah. to when I would work in the bank, you know, I'd be sitting around the table with 12 people and you know, 10 of them would have their laptops and you could see that they weren't focused on the meeting. Mm -hmm. Like, emails would come in, notifications would come in and would distract them. And like, you know, that's fine. But if I was going to be in a meeting, I wanted to be able to get the value out of it. Otherwise, there was no point being there in the first place. And so I would like to just have a notebook of some kind in front of me. And that was what I used. Yeah. And so that's where this product comes from. It's why we went to great lengths to make it like structurally sound so it can easily move around. I have a great story about that later on in the episode <laughs> about what that took to do. Uh -huh. It's like you can pick it up and it doesn't like flop down. But it's also so the idea of it being your companion, your sidekick, that's why this is not a notebook. It is yeah. a notepad. It is for things that you take notes on throughout a day or throughout a session, and then you put them somewhere else. This is not a notebook for you to save this stuff in forever. It mm -hmm. is intended that you will tear the page out and start fresh. Now, you can keep pages. I do. Like, if I've got something important, I'll keep the page. And you can even, like, slot the page kind of, like, in the back, which is just a little hack that I've done to my own notebook that I made, which is, like, a funny thing. You just, like, tuck it in the back, and it works great behind there. You can keep it for later. Mm -hmm. But the idea is it, with this product, where it's coming from, it's, like, reason for existing, is I've been calling it, like, an in-between. Mm. So it kind of fits like in between in your actual setup, but it is also like an in between between like something you're doing right now and your to-do app, or it's an in between between what I'm thinking about and what eventually goes on my computer. I'm sitting there sketching out an idea. Then when I'm happy with what I've got, I'll type it into Notes or Obsidian or whatever, right? Yeah. That is like the, the as we would call it, the insight that created this product. It was like, I just want something that when I get a phone call, and I'm now on a phone call that I wasn't expecting, I don't have to hunt for a pen and paper. The paper's right there, always. Yeah. My sidekick notepad is 100% of the time open between me and my keyboard. And that is like the, the cover has been designed with specific folds so it can stay comfortably open on the desk. Like that is where it comes from, of like being this ever open canvas for you to take whatever notes or whatever to do's that you ever need to at any point during the day. It's like it just removes that friction of let me grab a piece of paper. Like it's always there. Yeah. And it's very easy. I think a lot of people have this experience. I definitely have this experience of that exact thing. You've been caught off guard and some like actionable thing has just come across your radar. Like someone called you and oh, it's like, oh, I need to do this thing. I need to get back to this person about something. And I have definitely made some digital note on that in a hasty way. And then because Digital has no physicality. It's just poof, gone forever. And it's like, oh no, right? Like it's very easy to lose stuff that way. Mm -hmm. And my vision on this is a bit like paper products exist on a kind of spectrum of like ephemeral to archival. How long do you expect something to last? And the theme system journal is way more on the archival end of that spectrum. Mm -hmm. Like you're writing things in here. You're specifically going to look at them later. In a future year, you may want to look at the previous year. Like it is an archival kind of product. This isn't exactly ephemeral, like a, like a scrap of paper would be the most ephemeral kind of thing. But I sort of imagine that each page on the Sidekick notepad is designed to last for somewhere between like a day and a week's worth of work depending on like how much you write down and it's it's there to exist as like this is a the buffer of that size do you have stuff that you're like you're brainstorming something today and you just want somewhere to write it physically because i 
still maintain that like physically writing out stuff is much more helpful under lots of circumstances. Like you have this pad of paper that's right in front of you. It specifically has a dot grid. So it makes it very easy to do any kind of brainstorming on there. Like, or you can write on it. And it also has this little task list on the side of like, oh, right. This, I need to get back to this person by the end of the week. And I just want to put it here in this place where I'm always going to physically see it in front of me. So that's kind of my idea of where does this product sit in the like the one day to one week per page and then ultimately it does go somewhere else Mm -hmm. yeah like i'll very frequently take some notes on something i'm thinking about and i will leave that page like i won't tear it off then that also works for me if like if i'm working on some kind of bigger project it's just there all the time in front of the keyboard and Mm -hmm. it kind of helps me with then the further brainstorming of that thing. It's like a little reminder. It's like this physical reminder of this idea that I'm working on. And Mm -hmm. I kind of like that as like a way to help me noodle through things. So like it's 60 pages, so essentially it could be two months, but I think I keep mine for about three to four months because I don't Mm. use a page every day. Like I I don't need a full page every day. Like sometimes I'll just make a note here and then tomorrow's notes can also go on that same page. Like it doesn't need another whole page. So this product, Psychic Notepad, the price is $32. It has been made with very particular materials and processes, which have created a quality product. We'll talk about those a little bit later on in the episode. This is expensive for a notebook of any kind. I understand that, but I know what it took to make this thing, and I believe in the quality of this product at that price point. I mean, look, I'm just, I'm just going to say it. So like with the Cortex stuff, One of the things that's really important to me is that these products are physically nice to use. They feel good. They fold right. The paper tears right. The paper is high quality. Like you want things that just are a pleasure to use as much as possible. And that just means that the price of materials has to go up. And so like that is the place in the market that we're trying to sit with these products Mm -hmm. is we want to be making the things that's like, Yeah, it's more expensive than a random pad of paper that you could keep next to your computer for sure. But it's purpose designed and it feels very nice. Once again, the amount of effort spent on how does it tear is just outrageous. (laughs) But like that's a key part of the thing. Like you want it to feel good. (laughs) Put a pin in that, right? I'm going to write on my sidekick notepad that's in front of me right now. I'm going to write tearing versus folding. We're going to get to that later on in the episode and you'll see what I'm talking about when it comes to this thing. So it look, you just made me realize I actually need a second one for my podcasting computer because yeah. that's it. This is exactly the kind of thing that like I have my Cortex show notes open in front of me right now, but I keep them all on the computer and I don't really want to type on the keyboard too much while we're talking because it means editing work for you and like it also kind of distracts me a little bit somehow when I'm when I'm typing. Like this is exactly the kind of thing. Like oh, I need a second one for my podcasting desk for like things to follow up later on during the Cortex conversation. That's exactly what it's for. That was a part of the insight that I had of why I wanted it. Is I've always had a notebook of some kind in front of me. Mm-hmm. Like we work with Studio Neat on the pens, and we they helped us get started with the journal, and they make a great product called the Panel Book, which mm. I've used and love forever, but I was looking for something slightly different, because it's a notebook, right? Mm-hmm. But I wanted something that was intentional in the idea of you just tear it and move on, and like that's mm-hmm. what it's for. Like I was looking for this kind of thing. So, you know, like, but the idea of having a notebook in front of me all the time has been something that I've been doing in some form forever. I used to use field notes like this, mm-hmm. um, Rhodia notebooks, like all these kinds of things. So, again, it's like this is similar to what we've said about the journal. And the journal leans more on this end than Psychic Notepad, but you can take the idea, right? Like if you just think this sounds like an interesting idea and you don't want to pay $32 for our product, I just endorse the idea of having a notebook in between you and your keyboard, right? Yeah. Like They're not all going to fit as well as this one, but you'll be able to find something that probably can. Even if it's just like a legal pad, like just mm-hmm. turn it on its side and put it in front of you. Or even if you're, like, you're thinking like, oh, I'm not sure if I want to spend that right now. Try it with something that's cheaper and you will get an idea as to whether this is a useful thing for you in your life and then i'll tell you buy ours because it will be the best one you can get (laughs) yeah like i'm i'm totally behind that as well as like all all of this kind of stuff you you don't need to get 
our exact notepad to have something to write on your desk. But we're, we're just trying to make one that's really nice to mm -hmm. use. That's what we're trying to hit. But that is why like the price just has to be higher than it's going to be for a regular notepad that you're going to find. So as always, you can go to cortexmerch.com to get this. Again, we'll talk a little bit later on in the episode as well about that URL, but cortexmerch.com mm. is where you can go to buy this. I think you can also go to sidekicknotepad.com, but that's just like a way longer URL. So just go to cortexmerch.com. Yeah. And, and Mike, we've been training people on cortexmerch.com for a while. Right? Yeah. So it's like, go to cortexmerch.com. You can go to cortexmerch.com. But before I talk about the manufacturing part, I want to talk about one more part of the money part, which is shipping. Mm -hmm. I just want to get this out there, all right? Yes. To, to, so people stop <laughs> asking me. And if you hear this and still ask questions, I can't help you anymore, right? Like, right. this is the thing. So, shipping is expensive for this product because of its size and because right now, shipping is high. Shipping at the moment, I check frequently. So, US shipping is fluctuating by a dollar a day some mm -hmm. days for this product. Sometimes it's $11 to ship. Sometimes it's $12 to ship. Like that is just what shipping is like right now. Shipping is expensive. It has been since the start of the pandemic. And I don't even know if it's logistics anymore. I think maybe just the logistics companies like that the shipping costs what it costs. So they're just not changing it. But US shipping on this product costs $12. It's a complicated product to ship. We get a lot of people outside of the US ask us, why don't we stock in another place? Like the simple answer for that is, the logistics partner that we use, Cotton Bureau, have been great to us. They only have one location. We, for v about 100,000 reasons, can't <laughs> set up another location on our own. We would need another storefront, another URL. Like It would be very, very complicated, way more complicated than me and Gray as the only people in this business can handle. Like, Yeah, it's just too much. I hope that one day in Cortex Brand's future, we will be able to have multiple fulfillment locations. But with the size and age of our business right now, that's just not realistic for us, especially because me and Gray both have other things that we do. Mm -hmm. Like if I quit podcasting and he quit YouTubing, then we could probably find a way to do that. But that yes. would also be catastrophic for our family. So we're not going <laughs> to do that. Yeah. So I just wanted to give an, an, a fact that people may not be aware of as to why shipping sometimes appears to be very high when they go to buy this product. And that is because since 2021, especially this is for Europe and the UK especially, there was a new rule brought in that taxes must be paid at time of purchase and then that money will be passed on to the governments, right? So you are paying your sales tax, VAT, whatever it is, up front. So you may see, for example, I did this with the UK recently. You know, you like it's thirty two dollars plus twelve dollars shipping, so the same shipping price, plus around eight dollars to cover taxes. Now that covers VAT and some other kind of customs duty stuff. VAT is like the UK sales tax for anyone outside the UK. Yeah. If we sold Sidekick Notepad from the UK, from Germany, from whatever, we still have to charge the same taxes. Mm -hmm. So the price may be a dollar or two different, but it wouldn't really be that much different. So I, what I just want people to be aware of that they may not know is that their taxes from their governments are being included in the purchase up front. That means you will not get a customs notice afterwards. Yeah, And they were worse because especially in the UK, you would also get charged a fee for handling. Yeah, this, this is one of these things that changed and... It's just a, a subtle way that life changed for the better that I didn't really think about until we really started shipping a lot of notebooks. Yep. But it used to, like, I used to constantly run into this problem in the UK of I would get something shipped to me from America and then it would be like lost in customs for forever. I would sometimes get a slip that told me I needed to go to a website to like pay some ransom money to yep. get that thing sent to me. Sometimes I would just never get the slip and it would be sent back and it would just take forever to get some product. It was genuinely such a nightmare. Um, but the UK and the EU did do this rule change. It's like, no, no, if, if you as a company are shipping into the UK, you as an American company need to collect the VAT sales tax ahead of time and then pay it to the UK. Mm -hmm. It actually has made my shipping life 
so much better because now I actually get products because the thing is all handled in advance and yep. it just arrives at the door. And like you said, it's actually cheaper because they don't have this additional BS like handling fee at customs. Which I think was either like eight or 12 pounds. Like it used to drive me it mad. It was ridiculous. It was absolutely ridiculous. And there was no way that you could handle this ahead of time. No. But it has, even for me buying products from the US, I do have this like, <gasps> sometimes I, it takes my breath away when I look about how much it's going to cost to ship it but it's just because previously i would have bought it and then later have gotten this bill basically to have the thing actually be received from me and so the price would have been split up into those two things yeah but yeah so we do get a ton of questions about like i'm in the eu or i'm in the uk or i'm somewhere else and i'm trying to get this sent and like why is it so high and it is because of this rule change. And I have a suspicion that because the system, I do think, just kind of works better for all parties involved. I think more and more countries are going to be doing this kind of like, no, no, you just need to collect the taxes ahead of time mm -hmm. thing. So it's it's going to be happening more and more. But yeah, like you said, you know, if, it, if we have basically like $8 to cover it for selling one of these notepads in the UK, well, that would mean that we would just have to sell the Sidekick notepad for $40 in the UK. Yeah. But now we set it at 32 and then it's also the $8 for the VAT. So that's that's where the pricing comes from. The price is effectively the same. Yeah. So we would hopefully one day have some more spread distribution just for speed. Like that's the only difference. The difference is speed, right? So like if you're in the US, you might yeah. get it in a few days. If you're in the UK, you wait a couple of weeks. Like that would be the reason I would do it. But it's not a price thing. I think there is, speed is part of it. One of the reasons I would like it is genuinely just so it's like it's less confusing for the buyer. That's a good point. I yeah. just think as a user experience. It's not a great one. Nobody likes it when they go to buy a thing and then they're like, aha, but did you know that there's a hotel fee as well? It's like, what? Yeah. I bought a hotel. Why is there like a room fee? That's that's what hotels do. Why is this extra? Like that, that kind of thing is just unpleasant. So th that for me would be the main thing. Like mm -hmm. we would want more distribution simply to eliminate confusion because this is this has got to be by far like the number one most frequent asked question for yep. cortex brand as a company is why on earth if the two of you are located in the uk does it cost so much to ship to the UK? definitely not made easier by the fact that this product is made in london but like that's like a whole <laughs> other reason for that which i'm going to get to in a minute but like it has to be made yes. somewhere it just so happens that it's made here instead of where the journal's yes. made which is in poland it is going to be more absurd in a moment yeah. yes yeah. but uh yeah so, so, so that's our way to try to explain what is actually happening when someone goes to purchase this and like, what's this additional cost that, to ship it to where I live and where I know you live? And also there's just this thing of like, now I'm plugged a little bit more into like the independent small company maker kind of world. Mm -hmm. Everyone hates Amazon. <laughs> because what Amazon did for PayPal's mental model, including mine, yours, everyone's for what shipping costs. Yeah. Shipping costs nothing. Nothing, yeah. No, I, but it yeah. doesn't, right? Like Amazon have their own logistics network. You pay every year, right? Like a chunk of money and they make it up in volume. We are not making any money on the shipping. It is yeah. all going to the logistics companies that put these things on whatever it is type of machine. They put them on and send them somewhere. Yeah, yeah. That's that's a, that's another good point to raise. Is This isn't like on eBay, right? Where you're making all your margins on a like BS shipping cost. That's not the situation here. It's like, no, no, that's actually what it costs to move it from one place to another. But yeah, Amazon has like completely warped people's minds as to what it costs to ship product because yeah. of just the way that they work. Including mine. When I buy stuff oh, yeah. that's not on Amazon, I'm always surprised like shipping. <laughs> I pay once a year for this. What is this doing here? I'm buying toothpaste and literal individual batteries and having them ship with Amazon yeah. and it costs nothing. It's like, oh, right. It doesn't cost nothing at all. I have like a great example of this. So you're familiar with Comic Relief, like Red Nose Day, that kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a big thing. It's a big charity event here in the UK. Johnny Ive made the Red Nose this year. Okay. So he designed it, which is just like a cool thing. It's like a really interesting design thing. Hmm. I wanted one. And okay. Tom and Dan were like, can you, oh, we want them. Because, you know, we're just like design fanboys or whatever, mm -hmm. right? So I was like, yeah, I'll get you some. So I went to the Red Nose Day website and I bought three of them. And I think I paid more in shipping than I did for the product. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. You had to. Then I saw the next day that Amazon are doing it and the shipping's free. Uh, <laughs> right, I, right. I, I was like, yeah, you see? All right. But enough about shipping. Yeah. Let, let's talk about the timeline of this product, Mike. This episode of Cortex is brought to you by Issue. 
First impressions are everything. So if you're looking to make an impact of your content, you need Issue, the easiest and fastest way to make your creative ideas come to life and share engaging content everywhere you want to be seen. Issue is the all-in-one platform to create and distribute beautiful digital content from marketing materials and magazines to catalogs and portfolios and so much more. There's no need for endless scrolling through large PDFs. Issue features your digital content in an easy-to-view way on every single device. You just make it once and distribute it everywhere without reformatting. Your content is automatically optimized for engagement and therefore ready to share, saving you so much time. Issue also seamlessly works with the tools that you are already using, like Canva, Dropbox, MailChimp, and InDesign. I recently uploaded a presentation of some marketing stuff that we're working on here at Cortex Brand to issue. It was so easy for me to be able to set my privacy settings for who and how my issue presentation could be seen, which I really loved that I had that fine grained control. It was then really easy for me to be able to preview how my content is going to look to the people that I'm sending it to, and then gives me a super easy shareable version of this presentation that people could see without needing to download anything. And I can check that they've seen it. They've got wonderful statistics. It's all on the web and viewable on every kind of device. Content on issue can be published as public or private. Private only allows users the shared link to view it. And public content is available for your audience and discoverable on the issue platform. This is super cool. It also provides statistics on how your content is being consumed so you can learn a little bit more about your audience with data on impressions, clicks on the content, duration spent reading, pages viewed, and more. Issue helps creators, marketers, designers, really anyone who wants to make their content stand out. Get started with Issue today for free. Or sign up for an annual premium account and get a huge 50% off when you go to issue.com slash podcast and use the promo code Cortex. That's I-S-S-U-U dot com slash podcast and use the promo code Cortex at checkout for your free starter account or 50% off an annual premium account. One last time, issue.com slash podcast and promo code Cortex. A thanks to Issue for their support of this show and all of Relay FM. So with the journal, when we made version two of the journal, it was from scratch, but we were basing it on something that had existed, which was the first version the Studio Neat helped us make. So I was like, all right, I have like an idea of what I like and don't like about this product and like what I want to change and how I want to redo it. And I could kind of build it up from a starting point. But with Psychic Notepad, I was going from zero. There wasn't anything that I owned that existed like this. I bought lots of products to do competitive research. Yeah, I enjoyed visiting you at Mega Studio and and seeing the like just the stacks of yeah. other notebooks where you were just like trying to get some kind of design reference for what we wanted to do. The the result of which was like all of these are terrible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, it helped inform to me like how the cover should open, but again, it's like you would you would then use it the paper was terrible or you'd use it and it, the perforation was really bad and would like be messy at the end. And it's just like, I couldn't find anything that, but, and that's it for me. If I can't find something, then I know we can go and do it, right? Mm-hmm. If the product doesn't exist, we can go and do it. And this product initially, I was kind of codenamed it Scratchpad because it's like initial idea was it was just going to be an all dot grid. Mm-hmm. And as we were talking, I don't think you were super sold on it. And then just the idea of, well, what if I put a to-do list on the side and it was, we're off to the races. Yeah, like now this is a thing. Because then it was like, it has more of a story, more of like a purpose in that idea that you have in front of you, take your notes, put your to-dos down. Like it's got more of a reason to exist, right? Because it's, it's opinionated in its own way. And plus like the design... It was simple in a way because we could re we didn't need to redesign because we just used the assets that are in the journal. Mm-hmm. But I loved that and wanted to do that because then it builds like a visual consistency between our products. Yeah, I think that's for me, that was like a big moment in this timeline is one when we discussed the to do list on the side, mm-hmm. they said, I, I do really like that both of our products now have this like there's a thing that it's intended to be used for but it is quite flexible you can do whatever you want with it Mm -hmm. but but yeah that first version of it is like it was too far in the do whatever you want it's just a dot grid it's like this doesn't it doesn't suggest to me a intended use whereas like once those to-dos were on the side it's like ah okay i get it you've got like 
brainstorm, jot down whatever, make notes on the left-hand side, then like, here's the results of this on the right-hand side. And like, these are the things I, you know, like I, I was thinking about it for when I was a teacher, like that, that right-hand side would totally be for me the like, what must I do before I can go home today kind of things of like, all right, this came up, this came up, this came up. Like, I'll just put these things down here. Yeah. Uh, and then feeling like, oh, we can borrow the design language from the theme system journal. F- for me, that was really like a, this is an actual company kind of moment. Of like, oh, look at this. Like we have this visual similarity between these two products. I just absolutely loved that. And that's where it, it like, settled in my brain is like this is a thing yeah and so like then it's like yeah okay we've got this we know where we're going so i was like easy peasy i thought to myself (laughs) we have a company we've been using to produce a product for us for like two and a half years now like the first one was really easy we just sent Mm -hmm. them to the specs and they were like yeah we can do that so i was like awesome so i hit up my contact and was like can i get a new spec request form i got a new product and she's like yeah sure sent me the form filled it all out i knew how to fill it out now because i understand right. what paper means you know like I, you know it wasn't like last time where i was like uh white paper right like you know, it's just like i don't know but now it's like i can say well i want this kind of paper in this weight and i want this kind of cover and this kind of binding and here's some images and here's some reference and here's some diagrams and she was like great we can't do this <laughs> I was, and i was like oh my god not again yeah like it just it took me back to when we were trying to get the journal like redesigned or even when we were trying to make it in the very beginning mm-hmm. and like and i couldn't find anyone that would produce the product and i couldn't understand it back then and i didn't get it now and i was just mm-hmm. said to her, i was like why like what's the reason and she just said to me, what you want is hard to make and we would need to buy tools for it. And like mm-hmm. at the volume that you want to start with, that is not a thing that we want to do. And so I was like, okay, like, you know what? Yeah, that's, that's understandable. Yeah, yeah, that's I understandable as a reason. Like, you know, for us, I'm ho- I'm saying, you know, I said like, I'm hoping that we'll be able to order like this same amount once, twice a year. And like, she's like, well, if, you know, if you can confirm that, then great. But I'm like, well, but I can't. Right. Yeah. So <laughs> it's like, I mean, we could say we could confirm it, but then yeah. that would not be true. Like, we don't know if it was the size of the journal, then they would be happy. And I hope it will be. But they're just like, unless you can give us some kind of like you're willing to put down, you know, that you will order 10,000 a year or whatever would we'll do it. And it's like, mm, and we're like, no, I don't. <laughs> I don't want to say that for sure. So mm-hmm. I was kind of at a loss and then decided to play a card that I've had as a potential like escape hatch kind of card for a while. We have a friend, his name's Matt, who works for a British paper company called GF Smith. I met Matt years ago at a conference and we've become good friends. And he's always said like, you know, I could help you with all of this. And I'm like, well, yeah, but as soon as that happens, like we're now, we now have a business relationship rather than just a friendship. Yeah. And yeah. like, and I don't want to necessarily do that because I said, Matt, you need to understand when it comes to this stuff, I'm really demanding. I want very specific things done in very specific ways, and like, and I want it done just right. And he's like, "Don't worry about it, because I, I can help you." So I was like, "Okay." I, I called Matt and I was like, "Look, this is what I want to make. This is how I want to make it. Our existing supplier doesn't want to help us, or can't help us. What shall I do?" And so he put me in touch with a number of manufacturers in the UK because they're a, a British company who he thought would be able to help us produce it. So I had a bunch of phone calls, which was super weird to me. Where like, you know, I'd send these people an email of what I want and they call me on the phone. I'm like, what's happening? <laughs> Why is everyone calling me? Uh, and I remember saying this to yeah. you at the time and you were like, oh God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if they were just unprompted phone calls. Yeah. But, but this is, this is this also. This is how this know, stuff's done. It's how it's, it's how it's done. And I, I can also like, in retrospect, I can also understand this much better because in a conversation, lots of things can come up about little details that really matter that would just take forever in Super email helpful. back and forth. Yeah. Yeah. They're like sussing me out. I'm sussing them out. They're like, yeah. what about this? What about that? Like it would have taken way longer to email back and forth and it never would have been as clear. And there's a little bit of a like first date vibe uh-huh. to this as well of like, well, do we want like, 
do we want to work with you? Which is, is still uh, like, I, I find these, these business to business relationships just very strange in the way it all works. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's just like not the consumer world at all where you just buy stuff and people sell you stuff. It's like, no, no, no. How much do, how much do we like you? How much do yeah. we want to enter into a relationship with you? So yeah, I, I can, in retrospect, I totally get the phone calls. But yes, I remember talking to you about it and you're like, ah, someone just called me. Like I was just minding my own business. And now I like I want to answer this phone call right away because we're trying to find someone to work with. And it was, but it's uh, like, it was a little I stressful. understand the idea of like, hey, let's have a phone call. Are you set for next Wednesday? Like, but no, the, uh, all these people just call me. Yeah. Like just randomly. Which is it's fine, but it was mm-hmm. weird because I don't mm-hmm. work that way with anyone. Mm-hmm. And I haven't for like 10 years at this point. So... We worked, looked at these two. We had two companies that were interested in looking at the product, and I sent them some basic specs, and they produced for me some basic prototypes. And it was like I was must have been talking in two different languages to these companies, mm-hmm. because one was good and one was bad in every single possible way. I would try and tear the pages out, and the whole page would just come out. Mm-hmm. It's like it wouldn't tear; like it would just completely come out, right? Like every little button. It was very strange. And it was just like an interesting part of this whole process, but one that I was happy that I actually got options Mm -hmm. because if I feel like if I would have gone, if I would have only had the one option and it was the company where it didn't work the way I wanted, the product would have ended up changing. Yeah. We would have had to have gone in a different direction potentially. And I just find that like super interesting and was why I was super happy that I had options for these prototypes that was made. So we ended up working with a company based in, in London, which is unbelievable. <laughs> I know. It's it's shocking to me. And like on that idea of the first date, like when I was talking to them, I was like, please let theirs be good because I can get on a train and be there in yeah. like half an hour. It is just unbelievable to me that I can do this. Like that there is a company based in central London. I know. That is a print shop. They it don't have an office there. They assemble the products there. Yeah. Unbelievable. It's, it's like it's like magic. And yeah. I I had the same like first date jitters when you started talking to me about this because it was like, oh my God, this beautiful girl. And she lives down the street. Like it's impossible. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, please let this work out. Please. <laughs> it worked out super great. We started the project with them and we started going through all the necessities. And we started to prototype things and work through various challenges, which there were many. So like originally to keep visual consistency, I was like, well, what if we did the perforation? Like the perforation is on the journal where it's like the circles. Mm-hmm. So we tried it out and it was so ugly. Hmm. Because across that entire stretch of the notebook, right, so like 30 centimeters across, it just ended up being like this little sharp points the whole way across. Yeah. It just did not work across that long strip, which I never would have imagined. I was like, this looks so cool. It did not look cool. So we ended up going with like a more standard perforation. Yeah, it was way more visually prominent than you would yeah. than you would have expected. And and this is this is the kind of like little stuff that just really adds up yep. where you go like oh we're gonna save time this way and you go, oh no nope. this actually looks terrible it was cute in the yeah. journal visually distracting and psychic notepad like it just did not look right to, yeah. to have across the top it was great when it was when there was nothing torn but as soon as you torn one it, it didn't look good yeah and it's also because the way that this works is like you're working down through it on your desk mm-hmm. so you you are getting like a tower then of this semicircle pattern and it just it looked bad but yeah like keep in mind listeners every time for the rest of of this conversation Mike mentions like something that needs to be changed that means like a new physical prototype needs to be built like mm-hmm. it just it takes forever to do this if you really care about the details and this is where I like, I am so appreciative for your pickiness on this because like you also just for like for the paper and for lots of other details, like you're very sensitive to changes that are like small changes in a quality direction that all add up. But it does mean that like, oh, it's going to take a while for us to get this product actually made. From when we began manufacturing to when it was completed, it was 12 months. So like we had Like what would have been the final prototype? What was expected to be the final prototype? One year before production ended. Right, yeah. 
And there were many things that went into that, which I'm going to talk about, but like it took a really, it took so much longer. And this is, you remember what Gray was saying earlier about like, can we talk about this as we're going along? No, because at every single point in that 12 month span, I thought we were a month away from shipping. Yeah, we kept right? having this feeling like there's no point in talking about it now because we're almost done. Yeah. <laughs> but then also, and then as it started to go on, it was like, we obviously can't talk about this because we could still be another six months away yeah, th- from yeah, and, being yeah. able to show anything. That was like the second half that yep. we transitioned into is now that it's taken this long, what are we going to do? Are we going to start talking about a thing that we've spent months and months and months on, but that might still take a year before it can be in people's hands? Like that just seems like a terrible idea. It's been very weird, I think, for both of us to have this major project running in the background that has has been in this position of like, oh, it's almost done. Oh, it'll never be done. And that also just like we can't really talk about this product in any kind of useful way on the podcast itself. And also the further we got down the road, the higher the risks became because the product kept getting more and more expensive. And so... It was like the further we went down, the bigger a hole we were digging. Yeah. <laughs> right? And so it made it very daunting that like if it would have cost that price and it was done in a month, it just you wouldn't have enough time to think about it. Mm-hmm. But like when you're a year into manufacturing, it's like, okay, if you want to do it this way, it will cost X amount more per product. And it's just like, mm-hmm. oh my God, this just keeps going and going and going, you know? Mm-hmm. Because there were like all these little things where like I would get a unit and I'd be like, mm, I'd prefer it if it did this. And they're like, okay, but we need to buy a new machine to do that, which we're happy to do, but it's going to be another process and it's going to cost X more per unit. And this just yeah. like kept going over the course of that one year span. Yeah. A couple of times when you told me like Effie Berman is going to buy new equipment for something that you wanted to do, I definitely had a bit of a like, Ooh, <laughs> like this is getting into like scary territory here for what we're doing. <laughs> so here's the thing about them and equipment, which is different to the other company that we use. The company we use in Poland is a very like modern place. Like they have mm-hmm. like lots of modern machinery. Effie Berman is very much, they have like these incredible, wonderful printing machines that are very modern printing machines. But a lot of their assembly machines are old fashioned. They're like mm-hmm old reproduction machines so like the one of the things they needed was i wanted rounded corners right and yeah that they was the went one. and bought a vintage machine where they were able to create like a blade a corner blade and then someone would load all the notebooks in and they would step on a pedal and it would cut down like a guillotine Mm-hmm. It's like that was the kind of stuff they went and bought. And it's like that was the kind of thing as we were like working it out together. But it was one of the things that I loved working with them is so I, you know, I've said like hand assembled in London and people were like, what does that mean? I'd be like, let me tell you, I have met and seen the people putting this stuff together. This mm-hmm. product is not put together by a, a big printing machine like you might imagine. Like it's not going through this machine and then this robot's cutting it and another robot's gluing it and then another... No, these are human beings. I have watched them glue the products. I have watched them cut the edges off. Like it's done by hand in a way that I didn't even think was done anymore, let alone feasible within the cost that we were able to get it at. Like it's one of the reasons I've loved working with this company is like I know... I've met all of the people that had something to do with putting this thing together. Mm -hmm. It's just been so great for me to see it all unfold in front of me. But like, talk about folding. Let's talk about folding. I told you about tearing (laughs) versus folding, right? (laughs) So you, we assume, oh, the the hard part would be the perforation. The hard part was the math on the folding of the cover. So the cover of the notebook folds over the top of itself and back around. And it leaves you this kind of like border spine, like at the top. And we put the word sidekick on there, like it's branded, it looks nice. One of the great things about having such a long manufacturing process is I was able to take the prototypes and I could use it for like a couple of weeks, a month, and see Mm -hmm. how it would fare. And one of the things that was happening with some of the earlier models is the fold almost like would continue forever. Like, and over time, it would start to split away from the notebook. Right. Right. So like it would the the kind of like the, the edge of the cover that folds back would just lift and you'd start to see the, the paper underneath more and more and more. 
So we had to like work out what is the point where the stress doesn't exist anymore on the fold. Because if there was stress on the folds, it would pull everything to try and relieve the stress. Mm -hmm. And so we had to find a level of which to reduce that stress. Then it got even harder when I was like, oh, can we print on the back side? Like, can we do another debossing and foil inlay <laughs> right. on the back side of the notebook? So when it flips over, it will say the word psychic. And it was kind of one of those things where they were like, I mean, yeah, <laughs> but this is so much harder. Yeah. So. Like, we, we already have an engineering problem that we're trying to solve here. Yeah. And then, and like, and that's an engineering problem where you want something smooth, right? Because like in physics, you don't you don't want there to be more stress at one location than another location to pull back the top of the notepad to reveal all the torn off bits. It's like, oh, you want things nice and even. Okay, great. That actually turns out to be very hard to do, but we've got it. Cool. Can we put an uneven element that yep. structurally changes the stress through the whole thing by, you know, stamping a logo on one side? It's like... Oh, okay. Because <laughs> it's also, it's like, oh yeah, there's loads of ways you can do it. But then I'm like, but I still want it to be attractive though, like the fold. And it's like, mm -hmm. oh, okay, go again. And then it's like, you have to change the design mm -hmm. file because the Cortex logo's on the front, but then mm -hmm. the fold went right through the middle. So no, you're going to move that down now. So we've got to change where that goes. Got to change all the dies, got to change all the plates. Like just went on and on and on. And yeah. then with paper running out, global supply chain issues, Etc. 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 Like you know, th th it took a year because sometimes we were six weeks of nothing happening because there was mm -hmm. no paper anymore, right? So it was like all of these things led up to this, and then it ended up that like they were completed at the exact wrong time of the year to have them completed for us. So mm -hmm. like the product was done, ready to ship in the middle of November. Yep. And then we put it on a boat. It's the first time we put something on a boat. Usually we'd flown stuff, but it's time we put it on a boat, which was an interesting experience because when you book something for a uh, cargo freight on a plane, it's very reliable. Like, mm -hmm. you know when your window is. You could A lot of the time, the way they do this is like they fill the sp un unused space on a commercial airline mm -hmm. is the way that this stuff is typically done. So there's empty space because there's not enough luggage or whatever. So we just put it on. So you have like a small window. Sometimes it's like a day. But usually they know where you're going to be. So you get that window like a week before. It goes on the plane and it finds its way and it's picked up and it's done. And it's like a few days and you're done. But with shipping freight, it was like, oh, well, it's going to be this day. And then it's like, actually, no, it's going to be two more weeks now. Mm -hmm. And then it'd be on the boat. And then it's like, well, now you've got like four weeks at port. And it's like, what has happened? It's just like, it was very flexible. And again, like in talking to people that do this all the time, it's like, yeah, no, that's what putting things on a boat is like. Like, things are much more like yeah well you know maybe there's some space on this one or maybe there isn't and we'll kind of see and it just is what it is yeah i think the mental model for me for shipping it, of like planes versus boats is that it's a latency and throughput situation where it's like oh on planes latency is very low but the throughput is also much less so like yeah. deliveries arrive on a more reliable schedule but there's just few of them because planes are smaller and like those cargo ships, like, man, if you've ever actually stood next to one of those cargo ships, it's, it's like you're just confronted with the vast. Like you just can't even conceive of how big they are volumetrically if you're near one of them. It's like the throughput on global freight shipping on the sea is mind boggling, mm -hmm. but it does mean that the latency is extremely high because yep. if something goes slightly wrong, it's like, oh, it, it takes forever to get everything off of this boat. And like, you can just have these huge knock on effects. So like there's advantages to each system. And like, there's a reason why most stuff is shipped on the seas if it, if it possibly can. But that means yeah. like companies that are doing that, they have to be built in such a way so they can account for like, hey, stuff might not arrive for two months out of your schedule. Yep. And like, you just need to build your company around that if you're going to do that. Which is like going into the future is like a new logistical challenge for us. It's like, that's how I want to be shipping stuff more. Yeah. Um, so that's just going to be have to be a thing that we build into. And I don't know what that's going to look like in the long run, but it's just going to be one of those things that we learn. Like we have so many other things of like how yeah. to plan. And once a product becomes, you know, once it's been around long enough, it's easier to plan for. 
Like, yeah, things did become. We easier. struggled with the journal at the start for like a bunch of reasons. We never knew how many to order. We never knew how quick they were going to sell. But now we have like a real good idea, mm-hmm. and so it's much easier to fulfill that product. We don't know what's going to happen with Psychic Notepad. You know, we we've had it on sale for a couple of weeks. We did like a soft launch. We sold more than I thought we would in that period of time, but we still got lots left. Like we just put it up on our Instagram and stuff like that. By the way, you can follow us with Cortex Brands on Instagram. Mm-hmm. And I've just been putting it out there and people have been finding out about it. Um, that's been super useful for me to kind of like understand how to more effectively tell the story of the product, like from questions that people have had. So that was really useful in a way, like to be able to get more information from people. Yeah, I, th- I, th- I think actually that's something we should just just talk about for a second is like, yep. A thing that that we've learned useful just generally in business is this like soft launch, which I just mm-hmm. never would have thought about before. Because of course, like I come from the YouTube world where it's like, guess what? Everything happens on the one critical day, right? Like there's mm-hmm. no soft launch here. But with this product in particular, the rollout was, what was the order? It was first on Instagram, then on Mortex. Is that the way we did it? We never spoke about it on Mortex. We were going okay, we to. Didn't do, oh, yes, that's right. We were going to, but we didn't even do that yet. It okay. wasn't ready to put on sale. So we didn't It wasn't do ready it to put on end. sale. Yeah. So it was It was just on like the Instagram soft launch. And it's, it's just a great case of seeing some quirks in both like how we're messaging a thing. Because like on any project that you work on for a long period of time, you you get into your head little assumptions that you then forget to explain yep. when it comes around to actually promoting the thing or talking about the thing. You know, this is called like the curse of knowledge, right? Like you want to explain a topic and then you learn about the topic. But then once you like understand it well enough, you've forgotten what the problem was in the first place. And so you become bad at explaining it. Mm-hmm. And so like I think this happened a little bit with us where it's like oh we've been thinking about how this is used that like by putting it out on instagram we were able to see oh here's where a little bit of messaging has gone wrong and and in particular the thing that was very interesting was like you need to show it next to a computer yes and it's it was it was so funny like people we got couldn't f- <laughs> understand and there's, there's yeah. no criticism on anyone but like just the product photos yeah. people couldn't understand where does it go yeah, th- th- this was totally on us, right? Yeah. Like this is this is not on anybody else, but I think this is almost a comical example of how you can forget the most critical thing about what you're doing. The whole pitch of the product is it goes between you and your computer on your desk. It sits right in front of your keyboard. We did not show it in front of somebody's keyboard in any of the product photos and if you don't know that then it's like how big is this thing like you have absolutely no frame of reference for the scale and i i just thought that was like a great example of oh before we actually try to promote this very heavily anywhere we got to make sure that the product photos show a computer and the notebook in front of them because otherwise we'll lose a bunch of sales because people just don't understand what the thing is yep. or it'll just, it, it, it was almost even worse than that. Like the copy references it as being in front of the computer, but it's like, where exactly? Yeah. Because even in this conversation, I kind of think like people who haven't used something like this before might not be thinking there's like space between the keyboard and them, but there really is like you have space for exactly this sized product that's right there. And it just helps to have some product photos to show like this is where it goes. So I, I just kind of love that. And I, and I also thought like, boy, is, is that a lesson that there always needs to be some kind of soft launch. And also, I'll just say, this has, for me, completely proved the utility of Instagram, which I think I was quite publicly doubtful about on the Mm -hmm. podcast ages ago, where I'm like, Mike, I don't think this Instagram is going to be useful to us at all, and I think it's just a distraction. And it's like, man, just through this soft launch, it's like Instagram has totally earned its weight with me. Like, no, no, this is actually a useful tool, and I was completely wrong and underestimated the utility. Also, this product especially lends itself to product photography. You can just do lots of interesting things. It's like a nice product to take photos of Mm -hmm. because you can just put it on lots of desks and stuff Mm -hmm. like that. Like, I've been experimenting a little bit with uh, Instagram ads, like just like boosting some posts and stuff. And I've been doing this for, I don't know, maybe a couple of years at this point, just on and off. But maybe in the last year, I've been doing it a little bit more. And just like, you know, if a post is doing pretty well or we've got some nice imagery, I will just, you know, put a budget on it and like here's five pounds a day or whatever and just see 
what kind of response it gets. Sidekick Notepad has destroyed any journal marketing that we've done. Just mm. the images of it on the desk. I think because it is just like it's just pleasant to look at. You can shoot it in different ways, and it also is easier to like. I, maybe if I tried doing that with the journal, that would do really well. But it never, never struck my mind to like show it in use rather than just like show me what the page looks like. No, but it's it's a harder thing to do because like I've traveled with my theme system journal. And there's a number of times that I have tried to photograph it or do like a little video of it in use. And it is more difficult to show. And yeah. that's partly because it doesn't lay flat. It's also just the practicality of like what you're writing in it is going to be more personal. And mm-hmm. so if you're thinking about trying to photograph something or show it in use, there's always that little hesitation of like, well, do I have a good example page to show? Or like, do I want to like mock up a page? Like, I don't really want to mock up a page because I'm actually just using this thing. Yeah, I've taken it to many places where I thought like, oh, I'm going to photograph or I'm going to take a little video of this beautiful journal in beautiful Hawaii. And it's like, I don't though, because Hawaii is made of beaches. And so where am I like putting, am I putting this journal in the sand yeah, to video man. it? Like it just, That's I don't how know. You do it. Just dig, dig, see that, that to me, see you've missed a trick. That's like pure Instagram bait. Man. <laughs> dig the, dig it and like put it in the sand, put some sand on the pages, you know, like year of vacation. You know? <laughs> Next time you go, you got to take those. Right. Well, can we yeah. close the shipping bracket? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Close the shipping bracket. So I mentioned it being the worst time of the year. So it kind of arrived around the end of November. Mm -hmm. But we couldn't put a new product up for sale at the journal selling time because we had one focus in December and January. It's like sell journals. Like that's what the business currently completely is. Mm -hmm. Anything like watering down that messaging, I think would have been overall bad for Cortex brand. So we've now, they were, they've been ready since November. We're telling you about it in February. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, but but I think that's that was the right decision because this again comes into a like, what is your business? What do you want it to be? It's like we want Cortex brand to have a bunch of products, but in November, it is a business that depends entirely on one product. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, oh, could we message that we have this additional product at the same time that we're talking about the theme system journal? Sure. But why risk muddying the waters when like everything depends on the theme system journal? So like, we'll we'll just wait. We'll wait until after this like particular season has passed. And then at the start of a new one, like now we can mention it. And it's like a clearer messaging. It's like if we had some kind of accessory or companion to the journal, it's like, yeah, it's the obvious time, right? But yeah, this is like another product. It's like these are completely different products. They're just made by the same company. Mm-hmm. They're like for completely different uses. They don't ha- they don't share a story. Mm-hmm. They share elements. But the journal is like, no, you keep it with you in your bag on your desk, whatever, like but on your bedside, and whenever is right for you at a certain time of the day, you'll write in the journal. But this is like, no, just keep it on your desk, right? Mm-hmm. Like you know, it doesn't. It they they don't even they don't share that kind of idea. Yeah, it's a it's a more like work focused product, I think, yep. than the journal is. So it would have just been unnecessarily risky. But yes, I, f- I do feel like that was the the final cherry on the top of like the this long development time. It's yep. like, oh, it's taken absolutely forever, and it's all arrived at the one time of year that it doesn't make any sense for us to talk about it. So like, okay, I guess we're gonna wait before we talk about the kind of like marketing and what I'm referencing as getting serious Mm -hmm. there's one thing on the manufacturing we've not touched on which is the coffee cups oh yeah i love this yeah this i love this so in working with gf smith we're now working with like an incredibly knowledgeable company who are experts in paper so like we have these two companies gf smith provides the paper fe berman provides the manufacturing so these are these two British companies. We have Made in Britain certification, which was really hard to get. It's mm-hmm. like the specific stamp, and it's in the back of each Sidekick notepad to certify this product was made in Britain. We're working with these two British companies, and they are experts in their field, and we're able to have these kinds of conversations. And my friend Matt from G.S. Smith said, we have this paper, and it's called Extract, and it could be interesting as the cover for you. So extract is a paper that is made from recycled coffee cups. Mm -hmm. Now, coffee cups that you get from, you know, every single coffee shop that you go to ever, 
They are, by traditional processes, an unrecyclable product because they have plastic lining inside for insulation of water and heat. So you may think, oh, this is paper or card. I'll put it in the paper or card recycling. Uh -uh, Unrecyclable. Yes. Unless somewhere is specifically saying, put coffee cups here, that may as well just go in the trash because it cannot be recycled. Yes, there are many things that people put in the recycling bin that should really just go in the trash because they can't be used. Yep. And traditionally, coffee cups have been one of those kind of things. It feels like cardboard, and so you feel like you can feel better by putting it in the recycling bin, but like really nothing's happening. So G.S. Smith has worked with a company to create this product from this very specialized process where using these incredibly expensive machines they can take coffee cups and turn them into paper Mm -hmm. and it is as far as i know one of the only thing you can take these coffee cups and recycle them into Mm. other than just more coffee cups or whatever it is like an actual process it's a product that can be made from what otherwise would be waste so it's the paper's called extract And it was initially going to be used on the cover, so like just the cover. And it was proposed that we would use a gray backing board, that backing board that you've seen on so many notebooks, that kind of light gray with speckles in it, looks recycled. And they made me a version. I was like, ah, I don't like it. It doesn't look, Mm -hmm. it didn't feel premium enough to me. And so we worked with GF Smith to get a thickness of this paper made that they do not make. Mm -hmm. So. Again, it was like they gave me it in their thickest paper weight, right? So the thickness, and I picked it up, and the, the sidekick notepad like flopped and fell on itself in a way, and it, you know it just didn't feel right, and it wasn't fitting with what I wanted. Of like you can just pick it up with one hand off the desk, right? And it's just fine. It's sturdy. It's structurally sound. So we ended up taking their thickest weights and laminating them together. You kind of like stick them together, and you create <laughs> a new paper weight. The cool thing about extract is in they say every sheet of extract in 380 GSM, that's like the paperweight, contains at least five upcycle coffee cups per sheet. Mm-hmm. So for this first print run, over 3,000 coffee cups have been recycled to put into Sidekick Notepad. I, I just, there's two things I love here. One, this again is like Mike Hurley, product designer. He does amazing work. Like, like okay. the genuinely, like getting this like a, a custom paper thickness made like going to all the work to have this this done to get what is a a really fantastic cover for the sidekick is just it's so good and like i said before this is to me is more of like a work focused product so there's something just really charming about the fact that it is made out of coffee cups like yeah, i just yeah i just love that as a as a kind of tie in you know i hadn't put those two things together but like they work really nicely together right like yeah. everyone's in the meeting with their coffee cups and it's like this notepad comes from those coffee cups and i hadn't seen this number before but that's absolutely shocking to me that our first run is going to be recycling 3,000 coffee cups. I had no idea it was that many. It's a little detail about this product that I just I really like. This episode is brought to you by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform for helping you build your brand online and grow your business as well. You can stand out with a beautiful website, engage with your audience and sell anything, your products, your services, even the content that you create. Squarespace has got you covered to work on building your brand growing your business, anything you want to do online, Squarespace has got the tools to make it happen. It's so easy to get started. You just go and you sign up. You go to squarespace.com slash cortex, sign up for a free trial, no credit card required, and you just choose from one of their beautiful templates. It will fit the type of website that you're looking for. You know, Maybe you want to create a specific type of business website. They have galleries of templates that you can choose from that are all beautiful and really wonderfully customizable. But they give you these starting places for the types of business, the type of website you want to make. It even gives you like a page structure so you know the kind of information you're going to need on that website and you can customize it in just a few clicks. You can then get stuck in with SEO tools. You can use their suite of integrated features and useful guides to help maximize prominence among search results. This is so important for building a site online and it's so hard to do unless you have Squarespace. And then you can use insights to grow 
your presence online. If you've ever wondered where your site visitors are coming from, if you have a store, which is so easy to do for physical and digital goods, if you're wondering where your sales are coming from on Squarespace, or which channels are most effective, everything is available to you. You can analyze all of this in Squarespace's inbuilt insight tools. Then when you have that data, you can improve your website and build a marketing strategy based on your top keywords or most popular products and content. I've used Squarespace for nearly 15 years for so many projects over that time. They are the place that I go when I want to put something online. You should check it out too. Go to squarespace.com slash Cortex. You can sign up for a free trial with no credit card required. Then when you're ready to launch, use the offer code Cortex. You'll save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain at squarespace.com slash Cortex. Use the offer code Cortex and you will get 10% off your first purchase and show your support for the show. Our thanks to Squarespace for their continued support of this show and all of Relay FM. Earlier, you were talking about the idea of imagery, right? Being helpful mm-hmm. for the product. I thought as well, we should make a video Mm -hmm. to show people how they can use it. So I have been working on a video. When this episode posts, the video will be available on the Cortex YouTube channel. I'm saying that is the case. I was was like, Mike, (laughs) Mike. No, it will be done. All right. I spent too much time on this. It will be done. Listeners, Mike has been working on this quite hard and Mm -hmm. and a lot i'm also quite tickled because i feel like we're in reverse situations here mike is working on a video and it's (laughs) taking him longer than he thought it was going to take and it's turned out to be much harder than he thought it was going to be and now we're recording an episode of cortex where he swears the video will be out before the (laughs) cortex episode goes out and i have my doubts and it just feels like oh look at us we're in up up upsy tipsy turvy world like everything's reversed yeah uh, so yes, no, Mike, the, that video of yours will definitely be out before the Cortex episode goes up. There's no chance that it's going to take longer no than chance. you expect. No chance at all. Uh, <laughs> I've, I've put like 30 hours of work into it so far. Mm-hmm. I believe that, yeah. I'm currently at the stage where I hate it. Mm-hmm. Right, like <laughs> I hate the you know you obviously understand what I'm talking about here, right? Like everyone goes through this. Yep. I'm at the point in the production process where I have like two things left, and they're tricky, mm-hmm. and so I hate the project. But what I will say is, up until like three days ago, I loved doing this. This is such an interesting, weird thing for me, where. I feel like I'm able to like flex creative muscles that are not normal for me. Like I've Mm -hmm. never made anything like this. I'm not talking to you and showing you this product. I'm not showing you this product the way that I would show you a keyboard on a live stream. What I am trying to do is set up a bunch of scenarios where you can see the product in use, like how it's written on, where it sits, and here's some close-ups, and someone's putting it in their bag and taking it to a meeting, and here's a meeting environment. So, like, it shows Mm -hmm. you the story of how the product can be used because I just, again, it was like, as as we were doing going through the soft launch, I was like, I think this would be valuable if there was Mm -hmm. a video that just showed it in use. And so to do this, like, I started... And I couldn't get anything to look right. And so it has been a case of now, I bought a bunch of lights, I bought tripods, <laughs> camera sliders, like, and I'm building now a set of equipment in my studio, which I can use to continue this project. And it feels like a very high pressure task, like, mm-hmm. because I don't know what I'm doing, right? I have these ideas. I'm like, oh, it would be cool if I could if I could make like a little shot that looked like this. And about 95% of the time, I don't know how to do it in Kong, right? So mm-hmm. like I end up with something different, but it wasn't what I was imagining. Like my skill levels can only take me so far on this, which is not very far at all. But I have this other part of it of like, I'm going to put it on our YouTube channel. So lots of people are going to see it. And that's really daunting as well, right? Mm-hmm. So it's like, I mean, it's, it's, it's a very weird process, which is why I am putting way more work into this than I expected. Like when I first imagined this video, I was like, I'll just do it on my streaming desk. Like I've got a top-down camera. I can talk to my other camera and I can just show you what it looks like. Mm-hmm. And I was like, well, but what if I want, what if I get some like nice shots that show like the clear it's called a foil, but like the clear foil inlay on the debossing, so it kind of shines. Mm. Oh, that would look good if I could do that. Oh, but to do that, 
I need to be able to use this lens that I have and I need like some light. And then it just spiraled from there to the point where like I'm trying to make like a product video. Yeah. Which is really hard. <laughs> and, and, and like you want it to kind of, it's got to feel like decent quality. And like that's, it's very hard to do. Like there are people yeah. that do this for a living, right? I want to do it myself because like with everything. I want to try it myself at least once. Mm -hmm. And then I hope in the future we will work with more professionals on this kind of stuff. But I want to give it a go because I also want to make video and photo marketing a bigger component over how we show all of our products, especially Sidekick Notepad. Yeah. I think it will be an important part for its life cycle. Yeah. So like I knew you were working on this, but I, I didn't really know what to expect when you sent me the video. And while, yeah, it is not as good as what you would expect a professional product video to look like. I was incredibly impressed by how well you did in Mega Studio. It was also Mega Studio really paying off with yeah. all of the keyboards and the different desk locations. <laughs> like you made Mega Studio look like 30 people's homes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, it's like incredibly good. It's interesting for, for me to see because, again, like thinking about oh, what do we want Cortex brand to be? It was a real moment of, oh, my God, this is a product video. We've never made one of these before. Like when I made a video promoting the journal, it was very much like, hey, I made a thing. Here's how I use it. You might find it useful as well. Like that's sort of the pitch. It's kind of like a vlog. Yeah, it's way more on the vlog end of the spectrum. It's the thing that like what makes it a product video is like, could you imagine this just on a website for the product? You click it and it shows you how to use it. Whereas my video, like, that doesn't work at all because people be like, who's this person? Why should I listen to his advice? Like, it doesn't make any sense as, like, the stuff that I've done to use in that way. So I actually feel like your video is a big step in the direction of the professionalism of the brand. Like, no, no, it's a product video. Here's how to use it. Here's here's the kinds of things that you would expect to see. Look at it in all of these different environments. Look at how nicely it's filmed so you can actually see stuff. And I really do want to give you credit for the filming quality because it's like, so people take photos and you think, oh, I see product photos and they're better than the photos that I take. If you ever try to take a nice photo of a thing, you can very quickly realize like, oh, I can't get it to look like beautiful product photos do and i can't quite figure out why but if you play around ultimately like it's the lighting a little bit like you you can get there but product videography is like 10 steps up in difficulty from doing good product photos like you can do good product photos but good product videography is just so much harder to get looking right and so that's why I was like, I cannot believe how good of a job Mike did by just like getting some sliders and a few cameras and setting some stuff up in Mega Studio. Like what you're attempting to achieve is really hard mm -hmm. and you did a fantastic job with Thank it. You. So, But I'm also not the least bit surprised that you're in that moment of like, I'm frustrated with this video. Like it's not at all what I imagined it would be. Because you can easily imagine a beautiful video shot of a product, but actually getting that is very difficult to do. It's like the last part that I need, the last shot that I need, the one that's left, is like trying to show it in a meeting environment. Mm. And I really don't know how to do that yet. So like this is what I'm going to be spending some time on over the next few days. And then I think I'm basically done. Like, do, you have, do you have a suit? Can you dress up in like a little suit? Well, but the problem is it needs to, it can't just be me on my own. So like, I'm probably going to rope people in. It's most likely going to be my wife. It's like, can you just sit here and pretend you're talking to me for like 20 seconds? <laughs> like, right. this is probably where we're going to end up going with that one. But right. like, yeah, that th makes sense. This has been like the last part that I need. And it, but it's also like the part that I've struggled with like the most to produce. Really, this is, it was a, blessing like i showed you a car i hadn't shown you any of it and i was like all right i need to show him something at some point because mm -hmm. if you don't like it or like if you're like no you need to change these seven things because this is unwatchable like i need to know this now <laughs> uh and you was you were very kind like you're being now and that really helped me like it's it's helped me a lot to get this let final me just, part let done. me just let me just cut you off there mike it's not kindness when it's good right? yes. you're only being kind if it's yeah. not good and if it was not good i would not be and kind. this is why like, you were the person i needed to show it to because i could show it to different people i showed it to my wife and she, she you know adina provides good constructive feedback but is also 
trying to make sure that I'm happy. Mm. Where like, I'm not, what I'm saying, I know you will be honest with me, like 100%. Because you are, because you know, I know you know the value in it. Plus it, but it, if this, this specific thing technically comes from both of us, mm-hmm. even if it's just me that's doing it. Mm-hmm. Right? It's like similarly, when you made your journal video, you shared the script with me. You shared the video mm-hmm. with me, which is like, you would never do that on a, like a YouTube video unless you were just like, what do you think of this? But no, it was like, read this. Yeah. Make sure it it's good, right? Because even though it's on your channel. It still represents us. Yeah. Right? Like, yeah. It's it's like my video talking about how I did it, but it represents us yeah. and the product that that we've made. So like, yeah, it's it's it, to- it totally makes sense. And yeah, I also, like with many creative projects, you know, you show things to people and people do want to be nice. And so if a thing is bad, they'll often kind of couch their criticism in other ways. But my feeling on that is always like, you're not doing anyone any favors because you know where this is going. It's going to go on the internet and the internet will let you know if it sucks real fast. So like you're not safe. All you're doing, if you don't give someone accurate criticism for a thing that is going up on the internet is you're just delaying a much greater pain that will come later. Like if if anyone, if someone shows you something and they're like, what do you think of this? And they're going to put it up on the internet. Like you have to tell them if it's bad. <laughs> you just do. <laughs> but like there's, there's like this weird feeling that I have of, I know you know this, mm-hmm. right? Like just about anything that I'll ever show you. So I always can take criticism from you mm-hmm. easier than I can take it from other people. I can't explain that completely, but I just know that like you are coming at this from this very specific way where it's like I know how he thinks when it comes right. to this stuff. So it's just like an interesting thing. But luckily, you reacted to it in a way that I was not expecting at all. So yeah. that was good. That felt very good. Yeah, but that but that's why like oh I could be very positive about this video because I was I was genuinely super impressed. Yeah, I mean just as a slight anecdote, like I, <laughs> my wife, as I've mentioned before, was formerly a professional wedding photographer, and she also transitioned into doing baby photo shoots. And doing like a baby photo shoot is basically doing like a product shot. The baby is the product. <laughs> <laughs> But it is. It's it's like the, it's totally the same. I know same, what you're saying. Yeah, it's like funny. you need the you need the same equipment. You need you need yeah. the same kind of things. Like you got, you just need a bit more because like you need to keep the baby calm and you need to keep the baby's attention on you. And like my wife could take a photo of a of a baby that would make like even the like the stone coldest of people's hearts melt. Like she was fantastic at it. But I happened to need while I was away, I needed my wife to basically do a video product shot of uh, something that I was working on. It's like, hey, I need you just to get me a couple of like nice shots of this thing. And my wife, former professional photographer, completely failed in this task. And I let her know. And I was like, these are all unusable. I can't do anything with anything that you've done for me. And it's like. That's that's why like I was doubly impressed with what you've mm. done. It's like, no, no, this is good. Like this is hard even for like former professionals in this area to do. So yeah. And and like I said, it's it's an unexpected transition into the more business like, more serious future direction of Cortex brand. Cortex brand shouldn't be like the casual cgp gray vlog video about like hey look at this product like it should have these more serious kind of straightforward just explanatory promo videos that don't reference me or you or all doesn't reference the podcast at all yeah that that's always been the idea is like this should be a thing that should exist separately from us yep and like that's that is not a a thing that we have achieved but this really felt to me like oh this is a real first step in this direction there's no concept of of the podcast or of us in this promo video so that actually lends itself quite nicely into the year of getting serious which is how i'm thinking about this now yeah so that's the phrase we hadn't decided on a phrase Mm-hmm. But we we decided on this like approach together. But I'm thinking of it as like the year of getting serious. It's the theme for our business. It's the theme for our business. So yeah, we were talking about this recently, but on one of our calls, we have like a monthly call. We go over Cortex brand stuff, mm-hmm. and we kind of just decided that all right, we need to focus our company as if 
the podcast doesn't exist at points. Mm -hmm. Because typical direct-to-consumer brands, DTC companies as they're known, you will hear these companies advertise on this show and you will see them all over Instagram, right? They are It is a company that's selling you a product directly. That's what it means. It's like they're not going through a supermarket or whatever. This is one of the newer things that has been created by the internet and internet advertising. Mm-hmm. Typical direct-to-consumer companies do not have an inbuilt large audience that they can sell their product to. They just have to scrap it out, make products that look good, and photograph well and you mm-hmm. put you know you put some advertising behind them you try and build a brand around it and you just like you know scratch and claw away and you get there we have so far been primarily relying on the idea that we have products and we will tell you the core Texans about them and then we can tell you the stories like we have today and then you might understand it a little bit more and you may want to buy the product and that's great but the whole time we've been talking about like since the very beginning of Cortex brand we want to make products that people that don't know who we are would be interested in. But up until this point, we've not really done anything mm-hmm. for that. Like, we have focused them very much on, hey, you listen to Cortex, right? And the Theme System Journal is a tricky product to just get into because to buy the product, you've already have got to have decided <laughs> you want to live your life a certain way. Yeah. And... It has been a very successful product for us. We're very happy with it. It continues to grow. And that is in part because of the now body of work that we have here and the videos that you've done. And it continues to grow. And and at at this point, I think we're in a word of mouth kind of situation with the Theme System Journal. Mm -hmm. That especially around certain times of the year, people say, hey, I do a theme. And then it kind of like perpetuates itself from there. But the product is trickier for someone who's completely cold on this to sell to them. Yeah. The, the way I think about this is preamble is actually something I think a lot about when I'm doing video topics as well is like, sometimes there's an idea that you want to convey, but the idea requires a lot of preamble yeah. and like that. And that's the theme system journal has that uh, like ha- having a, having an inbuilt audience through like through the podcast gives us a big advantage in Huge. starting out this company. And we are very grateful <laughs> and for that. And we're very grateful Incredibly. for it. Yeah. But, like, but that's because everyone here has the preamble in their yeah. head already. And it's something that like I think I didn't like fully understand until we started to think about other stuff. It's like, oh yeah, if if someone wants to buy the journal, there was all there was already an inbuilt assumption that they've heard you and me talk a bunch possibly for very many hours and the journal can follow on as something like oh yeah i would like i've heard these guys talk about this sounds like it's worked for them i would like to give it a try and this product like the sidekick notepad has much less preamble for what is this as a product by a lot and i just i think that's like an interesting distinction that i i didn't fully understand uh for quite a while if like oh that's something to keep in mind for product design how much of a preamble does this thing need Uh, that is exactly it and i think this was something that i landed on earlier in the process oh yeah for sure i I didn't get this for a while because i kept telling you i'm gonna say it now (laughs) this is the best thing we've made Mm -hmm. And you kept saying to me, I'm not sure, man. Like, you're like, really better than the journal? Yes, this is better than the journal. And this is like a broader scope of what I'm talking about here. Like, you compare the two products, you'll have a favorite. But for our business, long term, I think this is a better model of a product. Because this is the kind of product that we are able to sell to someone based on a photo. Mm -hmm. That's all you need. Yeah, because you'll see it in use and you'll understand it completely. Yeah, or as, as much as you need to make the purchase decision. Yeah, as I mean, as long as we photograph it in front of an actual keyboard. Which is like a yes, if you just take a top down made. photo, it doesn't make any freaking sense. It doesn't make any you sense. Put it in front of a we'll keyboard, yeah. and now we're off to the races. <laughs> but like that is, and what I say is like not purposefully, but the one of the reasons that we're looking at this is like, all right, this is about getting serious now is the next two products, the next two major products that we are likely to make are more in this vein of like, they will be way easier to understand 
based on what they're called or how they're described or how they're photographed because they're yeah. just they are one of them's not simple but it is way easier to get than mm-hmm. the journal and one of our products i think of as a zero preamble products 100%, like it's, it's yeah. there is like sidekick has like a like a tiny bit or like ooh, what's that for or whatever like depending on the order that things come out but like one of them is a like no it's it's there's no question at all about what this is like yeah you get it immediately it's a oh, zero also, preamble product if i'm willing to bet the farm on this right mm-hmm. why do we call it sidekick notepad was well, because i want there to be other things like this Mm-hmm. Like, if this does well, like because I've already had people ask, like, would you do this? Would you do this? I want to make different formats of this product, mm-hmm. but it's got to do well enough that this makes sense. Like, yeah, maybe like an entire to do version, smaller product, and it's just to dos. The way I think about it is, if this works, this is like the founding member of a little family of products. Yeah. That's that's the way mm-hmm. that this could be, and this all lines into the existing audience is fantastic it's a nice advantage but it can also be a kind of crutch of like expecting that everybody who buys your product is like familiar with you even if you don't really realize that that's what you're doing and it's like ah but this is different like this has the possibility of just like people can see it yep understand it much more quickly and much more easily don't know anything about us and just go oh that's an obviously useful tool for my work life like yes i I would like to have this very nice notepad to have in front of my computer and to take into meetings and like tear off the sheets when i'm done with the day great like it's a very understandable we don't need the whole like let me explain to you what a theme is and why it's better than a new year's resolution <laughs> hey right? you know new year's resolutions they suck <laughs> yeah, right you know it's right. like you don't we don't need to do any of that it's like yeah. so you gotta have a yearly theme we'll see yearly theme was this one right. and there's three sections to the journal right it's <laughs> yeah. like it is a great product for what it does but it takes time to explain and it also makes me feel a little bit like i'm wearing one of those like cult style t-shirts every time i'm mixed it's like oh this but we're is, all you know. in on the cult of the theme man we're all in no, on it we're don't all get in me, on it don't get me wrong like, i don't have a problem with it but it is it is a little bit like i need to explain to you a philosophy right and then this product makes sense it's <laughs> it's a lifestyle product as well as it is anything else and so yeah. like so this is the area that we are now considering right so this year is now about getting serious for the next multiple years going forward and we're actually kind of borrowing from your theme last year where you decided, mm-hmm. I'm a YouTuber, I'm going to do YouTuber things. Mm-hmm. We're deciding we're a direct-to-consumer business. We're going to start to do more direct-to-consumer business things. Yes. So this is about now more photos, more videos, trying more advertising. Yeah. and More Instagrams. To, more Instagrams, <laughs> at Cortex Brand on Instagram, and trying to understand more the story of our brand to people that do not know who we are it's like at at a very important part that i'm now starting this journey on Mm -hmm. so i'm working with a few people in different marketing fields and we're like we're trying to work this out now of like how do we talk about the products that we make Mm. to people that don't know us why would they care about them like what is it and so this is the stuff we're kind of looking at it as pillars as well. That's what I'm being told. Content pillars is the thing I keep getting told about. But this is what leaning for what you were just talking about. Like we have these two different products, the different pillars. One is just like Psychic Notepad is a very simple thing in that like, hey, it's a notepad. It sits on your desk between you and your keyboard. You can take your notes on it through the day, take it to your meetings. Then we have this other product, which is, hey, let us help improve your life. And so like it's two different types of content Mm-hmm. And we're going to start making both of it and leaning into it more. Like similarly, like we have 138 episodes of a show that lasts about two hours. So there's all this content in there too. So there's things that we've said, things we've spoken about. Can we pull those out, make it more part of what the overall brand is? And this is now in like an exploratory process that we're beginning to try and understand what is this over the next few years? So... This is the year of getting serious at Cortex mm. Brand, which means you will now hear us say, if you want to get a psychic notepad, go to cortexbrand.com. Mm. We're not much anymore. Yeah. It's just a URL change, but it's representative of this getting serious about mm-hmm. what we're trying to do. And merch 
has a connection to something else. And so, yes, the Sidekick Notepad. It is fantastic. Mike has poured his heart into many details. It's been hand-assembled in London through machinery specifically purchased to make it. It is a fantastic product. Go check it out at cortexbrand.com. Almost makes me emotional <laughs> hearing you sum it up like that. <laughs> hey man, you have you have genuinely put a lot into this. I know. You you really have. And this is a weird episode, but like especially for you, it's the release of so much work yeah. and and really making it public. Uh, so yeah, you have every right to feel a bit emotional at the end of this process. Like it's real, it's out there, people can buy it, mm -hmm. people can use it, and we're going to see how it does. I would just like to say before we move on, I just want to thank Cortex listeners for listening to this discussion that we've had. Like, yeah. I know it's obviously like, I've tried my best and we've tried our best here to, we did a little, please go buy it at the top and a please go buy it at the end of this discussion the mm -hmm. middle really was supposed to be like opening up and letting you know what it was like for us to make this thing yeah i know it can the whole thing is basically one huge ad for our product and so like i really hope that this is a it has been interesting to you and it just i just want you to know it means a lot that you've listened to this yeah because this has been an absolutely dominant thing in my life my working life for nearly two years just yeah making this like it has drained so much of my energy this year to producing this thing and mm -hmm. it's been so weird to have this thing that has been so important to me work-wise and i've not really been able to talk about it and so this is 18 months worth of stories <laughs> in one episode and i also think it's just us talking about how you really are the lead product designer at Cortex brand. Uh -huh. Like this, like this is a thing that you do now. And like, what does that mean? That means spending just a ton of time on a product and, and making it nice and making it the best version of the thing that it can be and making something that people will enjoy using. So yeah, you you are now the product designer of Cortex brand in in a real way. Like the mm -hmm. first time we did the journals, everything was very slapdash and it was a bit like, oh, we don't know what we're doing. But in the in the second time round, it's it's just different. And you you made this thing from the total ground up. So yeah, you should you should feel great about that. I do. Thank you. Cortexbrand.com. <laughs> go, go we can go still say it slowly, you know? Still like, say it. Yeah. We can still say it. Cortexbrand.com. <laughs> so you can still do it. It's still the same, you know? Please, if you're, if you're still listening, go check it out. It's a, it's a great product. Give it a try. Let us know what you think about it. Yeah. Cortexbrand.com. This episode is brought to you by Fitbod. Getting fitter is one of those things that can have knock-on effects in other areas of your life that you might not expect, like having more energy, sleeping better. For me, being able to play video games more comfortably. But it can be hard to know where to start. And that's why I'm super pleased to let you know that FitBod is both an easy and affordable way to build a fitness plan that's just for you. FitBod's algorithm will learn about you. It's going to learn about your goals and your training ability to create a custom, dynamic program based on your experience in any equipment that you have available. This is all in an app that makes it incredibly easy to learn how to perform every exercise. Everybody's fitness path is different. Personal fitness isn't about competing with others. This is why FitBod uses data to make sure they customize things exactly to suit you. What you need is something that's going to like stick with you. You're going to need something that's going to work with you. And a customized fitness plan will. FitBod's powerful technology will understand your strength training ability, studies your past workouts, and adapts to your available gym equipment. And your training plan will maximize fitness gains by intelligently varying intensity and volume between sessions. This is one of the things I love about FitBod, is every time I use it, I'm finding new things in there. There's stuff that I know, so over time I'm learning some key exercises, but they mix it up. It's not the same program time and time again, doing this one, this one, this one, this one. You'll get a bit of variety, which makes it fun. And also 
when I'm learning these new exercises, I use their wonderful HD video tutorials. They're shot from multiple angles, so learning every single one is a breeze and makes it super simple. They have over 1,400 of these HD video tutorials, so you're going to very easily learn those next exercises in your workout. FitPod tracks muscle fatigue and recovery to design a well-balanced workout routine and integrates with your Apple Watch, Wear OS smartwatch, and apps like Strava, Fitbit, and Apple Health. Personalized training of this quality can be really expensive, but FitPod is just $12.99 a month or $79.99 a year. But you can get 25% off your membership by signing up right now at fitpod.me slash cortex. So go now and get your customized fitness plan at fitbod.me slash cortex. And that is 25% off your membership at fitbod.me slash cortex. Our thanks to FitBod for their support of this show and Relay FM. So every year I've done this for a number of years now where I take my timery reports and look at them year over year and see kind of how my year has changed. It's like state of the mic. State of the mic, yeah. (laughs) And it's kind of like for me now it's become like a little bit of a tradition and also thinking about how I applied. It's like for me it's my last part of how I applied my theme, right? Mm -hmm. It's like this. Like, because I can look at this and see, like, oh, how did I do in certain areas or whatever. So I have an image for you. It's, it's this also will be in the show notes. It shows on the left, 2021, and on the right, 2022. I have a bunch of like little observations on this, but I'm always intrigued to find out if anything's jumping out to you. Oh, so I can open this up now. You can, I can look check at out the state yeah. of the mic. State All right, let's see mic. how this how this was going. Oh, it's, it's your image is slightly misaligned. It's breaking my brain. Hold I on, a I, I feel, <laughs> hold on. I, I will fix this. I will fix this for the published version. Don't worry, it will be fixed. I was, I was like, oh my god, I can't, I can't look at this. I'm literally, I'm gonna open it up in Pixelmator right now. <laughs> I have to adjust I'll fix this it. The things next to each I made other. it with shortcuts. <laughs> I should have just fixed. Oh, it. is that how you made this? Okay, yeah. I, was, I was, I was. It's wondering. two screenshots, and they have a shortcut that just takes two images and will. Put them side by side okay oh pixel meter pro is letting me know they have a bunch of ai in it great yes i just open up everything's got ai in it i know okay select copy paste it <laughs> a new layer and drag it why aren't you letting me track this oh my god it won't let me do this that's infuriating why am i why am i an idiot this is the obviously you're having the same issues i had this is an impossible thing to align it cannot be done it cannot be done. Okay. All right. Well, I'll do my best. Oh, God. My brain is really breaking. Uh, okay. Well, the number one thing I like to see is we've got admin down, right, for Cortex brands. I like that. I like the less admin work, more actual, like, so, product works. Yeah. That's because everything related to Cortex brand went into Cortex brand admin. Oh, okay. Huh. So things got split apart. And so there was less admin, Mm -hmm. but then we added in Cortex brand product design Mm -hmm. into that. So that's like a new area, like 31 hours into product design and then 75 hours in admin, which is like one of those things I read. I was like, that doesn't seem right. (laughs) I feel like that should have been way higher, but I can't argue with the numbers. No, no, it's not. It's not possible to argue with with the numbers. Well, I mean, actually, it it, it totally is. (laughs) Um, That's like with the timers. It's very easy to like have some weird uh weird things in the data uh-huh. so i guess i'm also noticing is it that sponsor booking is gone because we've got two categories here for sponsor booking and sponsors yep right but it's like sponsor booking has disappeared yep. as has sponsor copywriting yep. and is it sponsor aftercare is yep. that also gone so i had four separate projects in 2021 prior for podcast sponsor stuff uh-huh. booking copywriting and aftercare and then just like a general sponsors one mm-hmm. to be honest i can't tell you what that even meant now looking back at it uh in 2022 i just collapsed this all into sponsors in one bucket because in 2022 i was dealing with this less than i was before which has shown out right like the it's way less. It's probably half at least. Mm-hmm. It continues to go down year over year. And, and I did a little consolidation to kind of show that. Like things like copywriting and aftercare, I just wasn't doing those anymore. Booking, not right. at all. So it's just like, let's get rid of those, put it all into one bucket and call it sponsors. So where has all that work gone? Kerry does it. Fantastic. Yeah. And That's going into 2023, 
it will be less and less and less and less to the point where maybe 2024, 2025, that doesn't even exist anymore. I think, I mean, I, I feel like that's got to be the goal, right? Is to is to get that category down to as close to zero yeah. as is possible. I don't think it'll ever be zero, but it will be like, my plan is like at the bottom, mm-hmm. basically. Oh, your mentorship is way down. Yeah, I had to take a break from calls for for a few months when we were moving. Ah, okay. Those like so, 10 way calls that you were scheduling. It's back to monthly now, but there were a few months where I just couldn't do it. And then also when I had COVID, I took mm-hmm. a couple of months off there as well. Um Yeah, that, that'll do it for sure. Yeah. So I wasn't able to keep the calls up to the same level, but mm-hmm. that would definitely increase in 2023 over 2022. It should okay. go back to closer to around 2021. But also in 2021 was a lot of set up for that. Like, mm. which oh, didn't yeah. exist in 2022. Okay. That, like, makes that sense. was when I started doing it. And so like I had to spend a lot more time getting like the processes and stuff set in place. All right. Okay, question. What yep. is this what is the this massive improvement in a category called self improvement? Yeah. So what is what is the deal with that? Self improvement is physical health. Mental Mm. health, so like gym stuff, therapy, and also if I'm in a situation where maybe I'm having lunch with a friend or like someone who I consider kind of like in a mentor relationship, where like the idea of this time that we're spending together is not just to like hang out, but we're like getting together and like kind of more akin to some of the lunches we used to have before we started the show, right? Right, like, okay. Well, like, we're going to come together and we're going to, like, talk for, like, two hours and it's and we and I was like, I'm going to leave this a better person than when I sat down, like, hmm. in some area. Um, it's like I have a few people in my life where those kinds of meetings will, will do a certain thing for me, it will invigorate me in some way or may open up some doors to me that weren't previously open before. And so, like, that is included in it but it is much more the health and fitness. Like I started tracking my health and fitness stuff in there, which was not, I didn't do that in 2021. But in 2022, like when I went, it wasn't everything. It's just when I would go to the gym, like other workouts and stuff like that, I don't count in here. But like it's, I'm making a very conscious effort to take time out of my day when I could be doing something else. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to give myself the hours. Mm -hmm. If you removed that and you would say a, much bigger because really my year over year is larger right my yeah, total yeah. number but that's because previously i only tracked work where now 150 hours oh okay i see right so that's that makes sense right so you, you've just added in a I huge in category yeah. that you basically didn't so so eventually you're going to slowly add in all the categories and then you're going to be just like me and run a timer all the time <laughs> no, probably not. but you never know i Let's i have thought genuinely i thought like for me, like I like to try and amend my time tracking to mirror something with my theme. Mm-hmm. And so like that was self-improvement for me was was the structure stuff, right? From mm. 2022 of like doing things to provide a bit more structure and stability in my life. Similar to home. Home was added. Home was 100 hours, right? Of just like, Yeah, I was, I was just seeing that as well. We've got, we've got home and, and uh, well, family management has done a huge uh, jump as well. Yeah. So both of those are increased because of all of the f- home buying stuff, right? Mm. Where like family management may have been more when we were dealing with like paperwork and stuff. And then home was more about like, I'm w- in this house and trying to get it done or whatever mm-hmm. it might have been at that point. So they all got added in and these were much more th- related to like year of structure. And so I'm thinking with year of the weekend, I'm not going to track my weekends, mm-hmm. but I'm considering adding something about like time with friends that's not in the self-improvement category like currently i've been tracking some of this in self-improvement but i think i might just have like a friends time as a category that i might track but Hmm. i'm not completely decided on that yet yeah just something to think about this is not a strong suggestion but just popped into my head is you could also just do something like have a have a weekend timer in the sense that if you feel like you're using the weekend well, you can keep that timer running. But if you tried to like break to do things that are not good for the weekend, you would have to stop that timer. Mm. Like, just, just in the way like I, I think of again, like I like the timers as a sort of intentionality tool or a what am I doing tool. Yeah. It's like, oh, I, I get to like clock hours for a well spent weekend. But I, I have to be aware of like if I start to do something that 
doesn't work towards this goal, I have to stop this timer. Even even if that doesn't mean like you're tracking the thing that you're doing. Yeah, see, I, that's an interesting. What I might do is create some kind of timer when it's like, I'm not going to like put the timer on on Saturday and turn it off on Sunday. But mm-hmm. like if I'm using my weekend for like an intentional activity. Yeah. Yeah, I might. That's a good idea. And that would probably, if I just called that weekend, I could then track things like going out with friends on a Wednesday afternoon. So yeah, I think I'm going to add that in now, actually. It's just a timer called weekend, which will be more for... It's like a code word, really, more than anything else. It's yeah, like, that's exactly it. Like, it, just just what you said. Like, because with a bunch of these things already, you're happy to lump things together in a single category. And so, like, having a separate socializing with friends tracker just feels a bit like no, no. You, there's a goal you're trying to achieve, which is well spent weekend time. Just try to track that and like lump a bunch of stuff together yeah. in that one timer, because it doesn't really matter the specifics of like of which of the good weekend activities it was. It just matters that you've actually put a bunch of hours towards that as a goal. Yeah. So there's a few things that I'll bring your attention to. Mm -hmm. There is a reduction in editing and prep of shows. One of the bigger changes there was when test drivers became the backmarkers that removed a huge prep and editing. Oh, right, right, of course. But then also the bigger drop that probably won't see an effect until 2023 because I did it at the end of 2022, was passing off the editing of Upgrade. Right, right, of course. Because now podcast editing will only include Cortex and the Pen Addict. Mm-hmm. So that's it. For also, something I've added for 2023, which relates to what we were just talking about, is there is now a Cortex brand marketing project. Oh, right, okay. So, right. so for like was, Instagram stuff. yeah. Exactly. It doesn't really fit product design or admin. And it is kind of funny where it's like, Cortex brand marketing in 2023 in February has nearly clocked as many hours as Cortex brand product design did in all of 2022. <laughs> so like, yeah. I'm convinced I've done something wrong. Like yes. I, that there is some there is somehow a 30 hour drop year over year in Cortex brand stuff. I don't know. I'm, I'm convinced something's gone wrong here. Because it can't possibly it be. It definitely true. wasn't the case. And so yeah. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Yeah, that's 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 definitely not the case. And th- there's also the just just the fact of like, I know that the sidekick notepad just like lived in your brain for hundreds of untracked. That's probably hours. part of it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, I, I honestly wouldn't be surprised if that's part of the reason you weren't running a timer. Is like there was tons of times that you were just like thinking about it in a way that it didn't make any sense mm-hmm. to actually be tracking, and that just kind of led to a being out of the habit of flipping the timer on at all. Yeah. That was in your head a lot getting worked on, even if it wasn't being track time for sure. And that one of the interesting ones is the podcast going down from 72 hours to 69 hours. Mm-hmm. The reason is because this year I was not doing as many streams because I was traveling to Memphis and back. Right. Okay. So there right. were less actual like me and Steven sitting down streaming something, which is what I did a lot of in 2020 and 2021. And that would just rack up the hours easy. Where mm-hmm. this time I had a big trip to do, which I didn't track that entire trip as mm-hmm. podcast of even though that was where a lot of it was being done. Plus, the biggest change would be no setup. Right, okay. Right. Yeah, I didn't have to completely demolish and rebuild Mega Studio <laughs> over the span of three days. And I think that that made a huge difference for that category as well. Mm. How do you feel about the comparison between these two years looking at it? I feel pretty good about it because one of the things that happened is I started to consider myself to the level that it is the fourth highest thing that I tracked over Mm -hmm. the year is like how I was thinking about me and making time for me. And so that was like a huge jump, like to go up to the level that it did and really only to be bested by podcasts, which are just an incredibly time intensive thing, (laughs) right? Like, so nothing's ever going to beat those numbers. Like it's not, it's not going to happen. It doesn't matter what I I do. I would actually argue that if self-improvement was your number one track category, that's actually a massive problem. I've done uh, something like, terribly. I need to go back to the year of structure. Yeah, that, that, that's like, that is a sign of a life gone wrong if your number one category is self-improvement. It's like, mm-hmm. oh, I spend most of my time working on myself. It's like, oh, you're doing nothing then. Right? Like, that's love, terrible. Man. You know what I mean? <laughs> 
So yeah, I, overall, I'm pretty happy with it. And so like, I feel like now going into this year, Cortex Brand Marketing's in there. I'm going to put in a year of the weekend kind of thing mm-hmm. in there now to split out some of that self-improvement time a little bit more and kind of yeah. make now self-improvement a bit more focused on overall health, I think is, is where I want to go with that. And and yeah, I f- yeah, I feel like you should you should have a separate category with it, which is just health, which can be like physical and mental health if you want to put those two together. Yeah, and then like weekend stuff get get pulled out. I feel like that that's gonna that just seems like that would be more useful to you for this year going forward. For me, the the term self improvement is works better in my mind than health, even if it's just tracking that stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, there is something about making myself better, mm-hmm. whatever that means which just is, it tracks more for me than the word health. Like health just carries so much baggage. Mm. And I think like self-improvement is like, I'm making myself better for me and for the people I care about. And like, mm. so there's just something about that phrase, which just works more in my mind, even mm. though I know it is not necessarily what other people would use or is like the most logical if I end up just using it for health stuff. But yeah. this is why these things are important to be personal, right? Like it just, yeah. it just how it works in my brain. It's whatever, it's whatever resonates with you. About taking care of Yower Health. Before we finish today, Mike, are you, are you are you sure you want to talk about this on the main show? Like, yes. look, I'll just I'm gonna give you like I'm gonna give you an out if you want to talk about this on Vortex, we can, because I have a feeling this is going to be a very uncomfortable conversation. But it's up to you. No, I want to talk about it on the main show. Okay. All because right. I spoke about it in the main show last time. I feel like I'm chickening out if I go <laughs> for more text. I have something else I want to talk to you about on more text. Like. Okay, but I just like, I, I see this this headline. I see one word. The word is Mastodon. Mastodon! And it's like, oh, Mike, I don't, I, I feel like right. I'm not going to like the way this conversation goes. Mm-hmm. So you would be chickening out to do it on more text. So I, I give you all the credit for doing it here. What's going on with Mastodon, Mike? When we spoke last time, I'd left Twitter. I was maybe about six weeks out from Twitter. Right. And you said how you wanted nothing like nothing. Twitter nothing in like your Twitter. life. I wanted nothing like Twitter in my life. That was what nothing, I said. Nothing at all. Nothing at all. I have now joined Mastodon. <sighs> Hear me out. Right? Mike, Mike. Hear me out. Mike. Hear me out. No, no but it's like... It wasn't even one episode. <laughs> I know, but it was two months total. I just didn't get to talk about it, right? I didn't even get to do the like, hey, how is it going not being on anything like mm-hmm. Twitter or Twitter itself conversation before I see this heading that Mike wants to talk about Mastodon on Cortex. So, okay. Hear I will, me out. I will hear you out. I will, I will do that. There were a couple of things going on over the time period. So... One of the things that I was talking to you about, I think we spoke about in the episode, but I don't remember, of like trying to find ways to still be able to talk about the various things that I'm doing in the outlet that I have, which is podcasting. Mm -hmm. The more I tried to do that, it just felt awkward. Like to, like, I'm doing this show and like, hey, I'm doing this other thing. Go check it out. Like, it just didn't fit naturally. I didn't feel comfortable trying to like shoehorn my other projects into my other projects to try and get people to go check out my other projects. Like mm-hmm. that just felt weird to take that time out to like be like, hey, come and check out this keyboard stream that I'm doing, or oh, you should listen to this. It just didn't. I didn't like it. And Twitter for me, it always been like just like a great tool for promoting the stuff that I'm doing to the people that might care about the other things that I may be doing, right? Like mm-hmm. you may listen to me on this one show and then you maybe you got another one. Like, hey, I, I like Mike. I want to know what he's up to. And so I would always post about these things on Twitter and it worked fine for me. Mm. Things with Mastodon started to pick up quite significantly after the episode that we posted when Twitter shut mm. down their third party app access. And so it was the second kind of shoe to drop, which pushed a lot of the apple focused tech community which is where my largest presence is to mastodon so they they all left to it Mastodon. one of the things that i started observing over this time period was that like colleagues of mine were gaining a lot of traction on mastodon in a way that i actually didn't think was going to be a thing for them like that their audiences were great on there and people seemed to be really engaged and so i kind of saw this as a point of like if i ever want to try this ever it kind of has to be now. Hmm. Because if I, in three years, I'm like, oh, you know what? I should probably be on that service. I'm like shouting into the void. Like, hey, everyone, I'm here now. 
too late, no one cares, <laughs> right? Like, so I feel like it kind of has to be now while people are interested in the service and it's got that like, hey, we're making it happen kind of vibe. I have a lot of problems with Mastodon and how it works. It's super weird and super strange in certain ways. One of the things I do like is I have my own instance. It's just, I use this company called Masto.host. I set up my own instance. This is, very, it's like complicated stuff. Essentially the way to think about it is like, I have my own website, which people can read in their Mastodon app, essentially, right? Okay. So I have Mike.social. And I like, if I because I can own the domain, it becomes mine and it also comes with a bunch of benefits. If you have your own instance, there are no trending topics. It just mm-hmm. doesn't load. Stuff like that, like things that I would have issues with with Twitter. Like I get sucked into trends and all that. they can't get any of that. Mm-hmm. So I am on Mike.social and I have set for myself a selection of guardrails which have already significantly changed my experience. So while Mastodon is technically Twitter-like, this is nothing like my experience of using Twitter before. Mm-hmm. One is 15-minute app limit per day. That is my maximum, and I am not going over it. Because of this 15-minute app limit, I'm taking a very different approach to how I use Mastodon. So I use an app called Ivory, which is made by the people that made TweetBot. And I open the app once or twice a day, see what's going on, and close it. Because I just don't have the time. Like, I only have 15 minutes. This is not enough time to spend a bunch of time in there. The biggest change is the following list. I follow less than 50 people. I followed 1,000 people on Twitter. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's too and many. there's so now the app is not worth opening for content for me because there's not a lot of content. There's maybe like 30 or 40 posts a day maximum in my timeline. And so there isn't really a lot to go in there for. So I'll open it once or twice a day. I will see what people are saying, if they've got feedback or whatever for me. And, and then I'm closing it down. This feels very different. Um, I know that this only sounds as good as my own, like well, how I feel, like people will take from this what they will. But I, there is an element of, I feel in leaving Twitter and I did it and I was happy and I learned a lot about myself and how I use social media and I'm applying some of these things to how I'm using Mastodon. But ultimately, I think I have a professional responsibility to be accessible on this service. I think in the long run, not being on Mastodon now would be not great for me. Why? What is what does that what does that articulate as? I think it puts me off on an island that I was becoming like just more and more conscious of and it didn't feel good. Like they just felt to me like an element of like I'm just out there, man. I'm just out there and you can be over there and I'm gonna be over here. And I felt like it was becoming too easy for me to just make fun of it. And I didn't understand it. And mm-hmm. I feel like now using it, it's like, yeah, okay. Like there are parts of this that are weird to me. I don't agree with a bunch of the decisions. Like there are things that are weird about it and there are things that are technically complicated about it. People are making it simple enough at this point to, to try and get started. And ultimately once you're started, you're kind of in it. And then there are weird things that you bump into. But I think over time, app developers are going to smooth those things out. And so it's like, ultimately, it's just nerd Twitter. Mm -hmm. And realistically, that's all I want. Like, a lot of the problems that I have with with Twitter was when it, for me, wasn't nerd Twitter. And Mm -hmm. like, there was just like stuff breaking in and taking my attention in places that I didn't necessarily want or need. Mm -hmm. And maybe Mastodon is a little bit less of that and a little bit more of the communities that I care about. I think it's important for me to be able to talk to people in the place that they are without necessarily surprising them with a thing I want to talk about, which is how I started to feel like I was doing on some of my shows and that just didn't feel right. And so I'm on Mastodon and my experience so far has been really good. Like people seem very excited about the service. People seem very excited when you kind of join, like which has been nice. It reminds me of what Twitter used to be like. Ultimately, it's still a service full of people and people can be difficult. 
but I am doing a lot of work in how I better protect myself from some of the things that have bothered me most and more. So I feel pretty comfortable about where I am now. I am aware of the fact that it has been maybe four or five weeks since I said I was leaving. Technically, I've left Twitter. <laughs> and I'm not go- I, I have never going back. Like I just don't need it in my life. Um, but now I'm on a different service. I feel just deeply unconvinced. I know. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm I'm just worried because I, f- I feel like a lot of your concerns were about what the what a Twitter like service was letting into your life. Yeah. And now you're talking about the things that you were missing, but the previous situation was you were happy to give up those things to prevent other stuff from getting into your life. And so now it's just like, oh, do to do to do. Oh, my life was clearly better without all this like bad stuff getting into it. Oh, but I miss the things. So let me like sign up for another service, which gives me the things. Like it's just that door is opens up both things. Uh, I know. It's like the good and the bad. So that's, I think that that's my primary concern about signing up. I, I will, I will always grant that it is unfair of me to take a really strong position on you don't need this because just the nature of your work does make it more much more useful for you as a tool than it does for me like there's Mm -hmm. just no argue there's just no argument about that so like i i will still grant you that but i don't know it just it sounds a little bit like you're spinning a story that's very convenient for getting back the thing that you had very good reasons for leaving in the first place i think the big difference here is I did not miss my main use of Twitter as like a consumer. Right, okay. And I am not recreating that. But I, get, I mm. think that's been a big change for me. There were two areas that were bothering me. It was the constant noise yeah. and people being mean to me. Realistically, the noise was a bigger issue, I think, for me in that arena because it was too distracting and I would be in there all the time. And that's not coming back. That is the thing I have learned from this, you know, my two-month process was I didn't need it. I didn't want it. Not for me anymore. Mm -hmm. And so now in joining Mastodon, well, I'm not going to follow many people at all. And then the noise isn't there. Mm -hmm. The other part, the criticism part, that's the thing I'm just, I'm working on it. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm trying to limit the amount of time that I spend in Mastodon, so it's less likely to break its way into my day. Like, I've done a bunch of things. Like, I set up the app limits. I've also set it so I never get recommended the Ivory app when I'm pulling down Spotlight. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's a good thing to do. So, like, there is way less of a pull for me to open the application because it's I'm not seeing it. Mm. Like, I have to have decided. And then if I think to myself, hey, I'm going to open Ivory now, I will... I'm forcing myself to have the second question of why now? Mm -hmm. And then a lot of the time I don't do it. It's like, Mm. I'll be honest. I am working through this with my therapist. He said to me that exact thing. Every time you want to open the app, ask yourself why you want to do it. Mm -hmm. And so then I'm thinking about that and it's giving me a second thought about like, oh, actually all I want to do right now is get some kind of validation or whatever. So Mm -hmm. like, it's probably not healthy right now. We'll come back to it later on. (laughs) And so, like, I'm opening the app more specifically. I'm also using tools like Buffer so I can post about ever opening it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's great. So, trust me, I know how this whole thing sounds, right? Like, I'm incredibly aware of it. I've wanted to bring this to the show today because I feel like I need to be open, right, (laughs) about this whole thing. You need to confess. (laughs) And I've been dreading it. I've been dreading it because I know I understand how you would react because it's how I would react if you told me the same thing. Yeah. Well, okay. So let me me also just articulate something here, which I would just like to put into your mind, which is trend lines matter more than absolute amounts. And so it's like, well, yeah, of course, you just move to a smaller social network and 
don't get me wrong, the pitch of nerd Twitter is actually quite a good pitch. Like that is maybe the best pitch for Mastodon I've ever heard. Is like, oh, it's nerd Twitter. Like, ah, right. That's that's when I liked Twitter was when it was older and it was just a bunch of nerds. Right, so this is what was dragging me in. Everyone was talking about it. All the podcasts I was listening to, all my friends like, oh, there's like these seven new apps and they're so cool. It it reminded me of like 2012 or whatever it was. Yeah. And I was feeling this drawer of like, those were good times where every week there was a new Twitter app and they had all this cool design and all these innovations. And I mm -hmm. felt like there was this area of my world that I was not allowing myself to look at at all. And, and the further it carried on, the more kind of like, it felt like it was becoming a blind spot for me mm -hmm. in a way that I started to become uncomfortable with and where I almost felt like I was taking a stand which I wasn't, mm -hmm. you know, and it. So I just thought, well, if I can manufacture this experience to fit more where I am in my life right now, maybe it will reduce some of the negative feelings I was having. Yeah, like I said, that's it's an attractive pitch. I totally get why, especially for you, it's an extra attractive pitch. But the things you're saying about like, oh, there's less noise because you're following less people. It's like, well, of course, because you just moved to a brand new thing, and it's always easy to start by following a smaller number of people because you don't, you don't have that like weird implied social snubbing as you slowly start on following a thousand people. But you know, like you didn't start Twitter with the intention to follow a thousand people. Like that just happens over time. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, that's exactly what will happen with Mastodon over time. Like sure. You want to fight how many people you follow, but that number only ever really goes up. It never goes down. And, and there's also just the question of will Mastodon be successful? Presuming that it is, that means like, well, people are making it easier for people to get onto Mastodon. Mm -hmm. And so every day that passes, it's nerd Twitter, but diluted slightly more. Mm -hmm. Like that's just sort of what's going to happen. So I, I guess I'm phrasing is like, my concern isn't necessarily that like right now this is bad, but it just, I don't see why this is ultimately going to be any different from Twitter just because of the way trends naturally go. The noise will naturally increase over time. If they're doing well, that means that they're growing, which means that it's not so much a selected subgroup of people. As it grows more and more, I just think like the temptation to use it from a content consumption side will increase. Like, of course, it's, it's easier not to think of it as a content tool right now because there's just fewer people there. But yes, I don't know. I just think about the trend lines with this and it all seems to point towards like if it works, it will just be Twitter again and it'll have all the exact same problems. So that's why I feel like, oh, that's going to be a, like a slow boiling frog kind of problem. And that's my concern. I agree with you, provided the fact that I, for me, my view on it is that I allow it to happen. Like my yeah. approach to the service is different to my approach to Twitter. Like mm -hmm. my approach to Twitter was I'm going to use this as a way to keep up with what's going on in the world. I am not using it for that at all. At all. Like, what's going on in my community? RSS is where I'm getting that information. Like, So you're just intending to use it as a broadcast tool? To be able to have a place where people can ask me some questions. Um, like, I was getting some great psychic notepad questions over the last couple of days. Mm -hmm. People were asking for things or asking me, how does this thing or that kind of stuff. So that was really useful. Mm -hmm. And also as a way for me to just be like, hey, there's this thing going on. Do you want to come check it out? That's my plan for this service. Hmm. I feel like if I can stick to that plan, I think it will be more beneficial than not. All right. We'll see. We'll see. You've got to come clean, man. You know what I'm saying? Like I, 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 I felt like I couldn't just leave that whole conversation out there and then I've changed my mind and I'm like, shh, nobody tell him. <laughs> yeah. Well, I have registered my grumpy disappointment. Mm. <laughs> Ha, 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 ha.